CataractCoach.com. Welcome to our podcast. Today's episode number 16. That's with Dr. Marguerite McDonald. Dr. McDonald is a true innovator, leader, educator in ophthalmology. Yes, you may know her as the first surgeon on the planet to use an eczema laser to ablate the cornea for keratorefractive purposes. But she's done many other firsts as well. But even more important is the story behind it. Do you know how many little things had to happen, some almost by luck, to come together just so that we could have eczema lasers now in our clinics to do LASIK or surface ablation? And speaking of which, why does Dr. Marguerite McDonald now prefer surface ablation over LASIK? And what's her secret recipe? She reveals it all. It's an incredibly entertaining, informative, educational podcast. I learned so much. I am sure you're going to enjoy it. Check it out. So welcome back to our weekly Cataract Coach podcast. And today we're talking to Dr. Marguerite McDonald, who's absolutely one of the leaders in ophthalmology, especially when it comes to anything refractive surgery. The first surgeon on the planet to use an eczema laser to ablate a cornea and many other firsts in the field too. She's won every possible award from every major organization. And she has a tremendous amount of knowledge and experience to share. And I bet we're going to learn a lot. So, Marguerite, welcome, and thank you so much for doing this. Thank you, Uday. Um, it is a huge honor and pleasure for me to be invited by you, who, by the way, listeners, was recently voted number two in the top ophthalmologists in the United States. Yeah, my, Well deserved. Uh, thank you, thank you. Like I said, my mom said, why wasn't I number one? And she reminded me that I got a B-plus in eighth grade. So I don't think you could, I could ever be good enough for my own mom, but thank you. That's a, that's a, that's a big honor for me. But what's really impressive about you is you're so incredibly humble and approachable. And you have a a history of really mentoring the next generation of ophthalmologists, Mm -hmm. which to me is the most endearing. What also interests me is that you were the first surgeon on the planet to do eczema laser ablations. And tell me what that was like. So you you did med school at Columbia, Ivy League med school, amazing med school. You did your residency at, at Manhattan Eye, Ear, and Throat. Again, one of the top, top programs. And then how did you decide to go to LSU with Herb Kaufman to learn refractive surgery or corneal surgery? Well, uh, Herb Kaufman was, at the time, the top cornea specialist in the world. People were flying in on private jets from all over the world to have him do their corneal surgery. Uh, He was cutting edge on everything. Uh, When he was 26 without any virology background, he invented the first antiviral drug in ophthalmology. Wow. He had, he had, and he, he landed on the cover of Time Magazine when he was 26 years old. Wow, that's um, amazing. He, when he was a uh, resident at Mass Near, the University of Florida came to him and said, sir, when you finish your training, would you come be our chairman? Yeah. Whoa. From, from, so, from, from finishing your training to chairman? Yes, yes. And he did. He accepted it. So uh, he, he was just an extraordinary person. And um, I applied for the fellowship. I was extremely lucky to get it. And uh, the magic of his department, if I could take a sidebar here. Sure. He, he had MDs and PhDs assigned to pods. So... If you were interested in cornea and cornea research, you were all together in one area and you used the same water fountain and you used the same, same everything. You saw each other nonstop. Most departments keep their PhDs in a separate yes. building mm-hmm. and they're not even invited to faculty meeting. Um, he underpaid, Kaufman underpaid the MDs a little so he could overpay the PhDs a little according to the growing scale, you know, the, whatever the scale was at the time so that they would be equals. Parity. Yes, the MDs got a window in their office, the PhDs got a window in their lab, everything was parity. And because the PhDs felt equal to us, we, we all talked and had great research ideas and worked together and some of us even married each other. <laughs> I married Dr. Steve Kleiss, but... Um, you know, it was just a magical place to be. And when I arrived there, Kaufman had just given the Jackson Memorial Lecture and he was 
the subject of great criticism because he gave it on the topic of epicaridophagia, which mm. was the living contact lens, and he had like three or four patients who were two weeks post-op. And he got a lot of criticism for doing that. And when I arrived, he said, Marguerite, you're going to help me make this work. We're going to make epicaridophagia work. And only older ophthalmologists remember this, but epicaridophagia, uh, we taught hundreds of people internationally how to do it. AMO made little corneal lenticles that were ground to the patient's prescription. You could order a toric lens. You could order minus four plus 350 at 75 degrees. We would make it, freeze dry it, ship it to the surgeon. They poured BSS on it. It fluffed up and they sewed it on the front of the eye after removing the epithelium. So I, I stepped into the middle of this, this wonderful, exciting department, and I was honored to play a big role in epicaridophagia. As a matter of fact, um, I still have some of the boxes that are from oh, AMO, wow. AMO that are labeled KME, the Kaufman McDonald Epicaridophagia Procedure. Wow. So, and that was a kind of a crazy thing for, um, here I was, I was in my 20s still, and um, I'm, I'm looking at rooms full of gray-haired <laughs> surgeons, no women, no women, <laughs> and uh, going all over the world teaching this. So, of course, it got replaced by other technologies. It took six weeks for the lenticles to clear in an adult human uh, luckily, only two weeks uh, in infants, so uh, it was very useful for pediatric aphakia. Oh, wow. And, um, I mean, those, they cleared like this, and, and the results were terrific. And they were removable, reversible, repeatable. So, um, but eventually other technologies replaced it, but it was great. So at about the same time, uh, we became one of the perk centers for the perspective evaluation of radial keratotomy. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. And I was honored to be the perk surgeon. Uh, so through, through real luck, I ended up in this hotbed of refractive surgery. And, um, and it, it was just a joy. I mean, I worked very, very hard, but uh, like all fellows do, but um, it, it was just amazing. People were flying in on a weekly basis, doctors from all over to watch us do RK to learn more about epicaridophagia. Sure. Wow. And you said you even had patients flying in from all over the planet too, basically. Yeah. And, and they had been doing that for years for Dr. Kaufman. Yes, absolutely. So how did you go from, you're doing epicaridophagia, you're doing the, the RK study, the PERC study. Where did eczema lasers come from? How, we, I don't actually know. What was the birth of eczema lasers in the U.S. So, or worldwide? Uh, Great question. I, uh, I was not long out of my fellowship, but in the middle of all this epicaridophagia RK stuff in the department, and I read Dr. Steve Trokel's landmark 1983 paper in the AJO, and he had taken an eczema laser from Silicon Valley, uh, a little laser that was used to make silicone chips, and he just shot randomly some lines, some incisions across pig and cow cadaver eyes, cadaver corneas. No attempt at a refractive correction. He just strafed these corneas and said, look at this. Uh, it's possible to make incisions in the cornea without thermal damage. Hmm. So I said, oh my gosh. <laughs> and I called him up and I said, do you remember me? Uh, when I was at Columbia Medical School, which is where Dr. Trokel is located still. When I was at medical school, I asked him to give me aqueous humor from his cataract surgeries that served as the control for my retinoblastoma uh, studies. But I said, remember me? We, you helped me with my right, retinoblastoma research a few years uh -huh. ago. You need monkeys. The, the vivarium on the uh, Upper West Side at Columbia has like three monkeys, two rabbits. You need lots and lots of animals. I have lots of animals. I am down at LSU now. And, um, you know, I'd love to work with you and Dr. Munderland. So it was the three of us. We became like the three wow. legs of a stool. Wow. So they, after your fellowship at LSU, they loved you so much. They didn't let you leave. No, they, they were kind enough to offer me a job. And, uh, and I stayed there. I stayed there for uh, a very long time. And, um, you know, we, so 
this is long before any advanced technology. I'm not even sure we had fax machines then. We certainly, you know, had the phone, and that was about it, and snail mail. <clears throat> so Charles Mundelin in California, Steve Trokel in Manhattan, and myself at LSU in New Orleans, we worked together. We were on the phone day and night. They would frequently fly down. First, we did countless plastic discs. Okay. Then we did cadaver animal eyes. Then we did living animals. And I must say, uh, the rabbits came first, and my goodness, uh, they did not do well at first. They did not do well. We knew nothing about laser vision correction at that time, of course. Nobody did. Mm -hmm. So our, we shot at the rabbits from six feet away. Wow, okay. At, from six feet away. And we had a diaphragm that had five positions, and I cranked it closed by hand. So we'd shoot for a few seconds. Marguerite would go crank, crank, crank. Then we'd shoot for a few more seconds. So there was mm -hmm. a stepped ablation with five big steps. Of course, we didn't know smoother was better. We didn't know this. Sure. And the rabbits developed these thick hyperplastic white scars. It was horrible. Oh. In, in one in one week, <clears throat> excuse me. In one week, we had my research coordinator and my cornea fellow both quit. They said, "This project is a loser. We're out of oh. here." <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> that was pretty grim. So. We had a conference call about this, and uh, I said to Charles and Steve, you know, let's before we throw in the towel, let's try something else. And I honestly don't remember which one of us came up with that, maybe all three of us, but we said, let's try making the ablation smoother. Let's see if that sure. matters. So Charles rigged the hand crank to close automatically in 40 steps. Oh, instead of five. Instead of five. So... 40 steps now looks incredibly crude to us. But at the time, the rabbits got a lot better. Uh, and uh, we said, you know, maybe there's something to the to the smoothness bit here. So, And this is just scraping off epithelium and going right into the stroma. Right. Uh, it was okay. PRK. It was PRK. And by the way, um, after Trokel's paper, there were two or three research groups around the world that popped up doing eczema research also. But they... Spent years doing RK. We did RK research for about two days, and we realized that was not the proper use of the the eczema laser. Sure. Uh, and moved on to surface ablation immediately. So the rabbits looked better. Uh, we decided to move on to monkeys. Meanwhile, we're submitting all this data to the FDA, and the FDA. <laughs> uh, was not happy with us. Uh, they mm -hmm. said, why are you doing this? You're firing a laser at the visual axis of people who don't like their glasses. <laughs> they, they, you know, they, uh, why aren't you doing uh, diabetic retinopathy, retinopathy research? Why aren't you doing glaucoma research? Sure. This is silly and dangerous. And that was the prevailing view, let me tell you. Uh, it was swimming upstream. Uh, we were considered silly and dangerous uh, people. <laughs> so I actually uh, got an NIH grant to study this. And um, th there were people complaining that the federal government should not be giving money for this kind of research. But anyway, we got to the monkeys. We did so so many monkeys, and the results were getting better and better, and we were making the ablation smoother and smoother. So we do a bunch of monkeys, submit the data, retinoscopy, pathology, and the results were amazing, but the FDA said, do more monkeys. Mm -hmm. do, more, do more monkeys. So I really thought we'd be doing monkeys forever when we got a call from the oculoplastic service at LSU, and they said, we have a 62-year-old woman here. She has a perfectly healthy 2020 eye, uncorrected, that she's about to lose during an exoneration for orbital melanoma. And we're going to do her exoneration in a few days, but she has volunteered to let someone experiment on this eye before she loses it. Oh. At just so there's, there's no downside. No, and 
uh, here she is facing absolute, you know, disfigurement. Sure. And they told her probable death anyway, but this was her only shot. And in the middle of all that grief, she, she made this extraordinary offer. So the FDA said, you can, you can do it. So we took her out to the primate center, past all the monkeys who were spitting and shrieking at her. Uh-huh. And we laid her down under the laser, and she was a 2020 Plano. Uh, this was an, you know, an eye that needed no correction. And we made her uh, four and a half diopters hyperopic. We did a four and a half diopter myopic ablation. Wow. And of course, she was uncomfortable because we didn't know much about pain control back then. So we made her blurry and uncomfortable, and we followed her every single day. And we did retinoscopy, and we did topography, and we did everything. And we, we got the specimen afterward, and we gave it all to the FDA, and they finally said, okay, you can start the blind eye clinical trial in humans. So Mrs. Uh, Cassidy, her name was Alberta Cassidy. She let us use her name. She died of metastatic melanoma six months later. Oh, my goodness. But we got permission from LSU to name our humble little laser trailer, the Alberta Cassidy uh, Eczema Laser uh, Laboratory. And it was a big fight because the university said, we only, give, we only name things after people who give us a lot of money. I said, what else could she give us? She, what, what more could this lady have given us? So uh, we owe a lot to Alberta Cassidy. Anyway, um, the university wouldn't let us bring the laser across the lake from Lake Pontchartrain from the primate center into the medical school because they were afraid it would leak and the gas would kill everyone. So we okay. <laughs> so we okay. were we were allowed to put it in a trailer, the one that was named after Alberta Cassidy. So we were in a trailer right outside the medical school and next to the trash compactor. <laughs> oh gosh, Prime, the prime real estate. So it, the whole area stunk to high heaven, and uh-huh. we'd be in the middle of doing surgery, and all of a sudden our trailer would shake because the track, trash compactor was starting up. Oh, my goodness. I, I went nuts. I went out and I said, you, you can't, when you see this little red flag up, that means we're operating here, you can't operate the trash compactor. And they were union guys. They said, <laughs> we have to stay on a schedule. I went to the dean. I went to everyone, and I said, I'm going to show you what damage you're doing. We're going to analyze the data from the patients that were operated when the trash compactor was okay. operating and the people when they were, you know, in a silent room that wasn't shaking without the trash compactor. And much to my surprise, the trash compactor patients did better. What? Why? 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 Because it was making it smoother. Oh, all that, all that gentle shaking. So... We thought we had figured out the smooth thing. No, you can't make it smooth enough. It's not oh. possible to make the ablation. So I stopped complaining. <laughs> I stopped complaining. I let <gasps> them turn on the compactor anytime they wanted, and we increased the number of steps. And, of course, as we moved through the blind eyes, the partially sighted eyes, the sighted eyes with myopia, then myopic astigmatism, then hyperopia, as we moved through each group, Sure. We got smoother and smoother ablations. We moved to flying spots, of course. Mm-hmm. And um, the rest is history. <laughs> well, the, the crazy part is, is that how many things had to kind of happen, oftentimes by serendipity, just for this to have succeeded? Yes. You know, if I, I've often said if it weren't for Alberta Cassidy, we might still be doing monkeys. You right? Know? It, was, it was that crazy. There were... Angry editorials, uh, one of the most famous living ophthalmologists at the time wrote an editorial in a very famous peer-reviewed journal that attacked me personally and said I was lying and making up data. What? Yeah, and that, and that it was unethical to do this kind of thing, and I'm lying. Uh, it was just, it was rough. You had to have very thick skin. Very thick wow, skin. that's no joke. Yeah, I mean, I guess the sometimes the the current dogma takes a long time to change, right? A, a, a decade or two prior, that's when the, everyone said that eye wells were bad. Eye wells were a ticking time bomb in the eye, was the quote, right? And poor Charlie Kelman, right? Poor Charlie Kelman, how he was, you know, uh, 
he was fried. He was fried by by the the doctors at the time at the stat by the status quo. So, um, but it was all worth it. You're right. There were many little twists of fate along the way, uh, but um, really, you know, I, I, there are times when I've said we should call all this the Cassidy procedures. Yeah, and for they, sure. Yeah, you know, I mean, really, uh, that's how much she contributed to medicine. The way we well, I mean, especially the story about the trash compactor, and then therefore, as it, as it shook the bed or shook the laser, it smoothed out the ablation. Wow, that's just yeah. you would have never known otherwise. You know, we we thought okay when we went to five to forty. Okay, that's good. Forty, that's good. No, 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 no. It has to be infinitely smooth. Is um, there still a role then for broad beam lasers? There's still broad beam lasers available, or should we only be using flying spot? To have a much smoother ablation? I don't know the answer. Um, really, it's flying spots. Is what, yeah. There is no way to make, uh, in my opinion, I don't, I don't think there is a way to make a closing diaphragm smooth enough. Maybe, maybe uh, engineers could take another look at it, but the flying spots are the way to go. And, of course, there are multiple flying spots now, so the ablations don't take a long that time. Long. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, laser. I mean, obviously, the the evolution of lasers is amazing. Of Exmer lasers, and yeah. so that's that that's that's changed it tremendously. Why do you think there's a big resistance then? Like, I would think that getting an Exmer laser ablation would be like getting braces. Like every twelve or thirteen year old child in America, or almost many of them, get braces to have straight teeth later in life. Wouldn't you, you know, just say, okay, twenty two year old, you're done with your your schooling, your myopia stabilized, let's do your LASIK or PRK. I thought that would happen. I thought uh, every child in a middle-class family that could afford it would give them their braces at 11 and, and their laser vision correction at 22. I thought that would happen, and it didn't. And I've given it a lot of thought. Um, I think mostly it's because every few years there is an extremely negative LASIK story <laughs> that hits the media. Extremely negative. Right. Uh, and um, sometimes you do have to wonder about the motivation of the people who are releasing these stories. Sure. Uh, it's been carefully studied. There is no more successful uh, elective surgical procedure uh, in, in the world than the laser vision correction. <clears throat> uh, it, of course, it's, it's expensive. Um, and I, th I think we did ourselves a lot of damage uh, early on with the price wars. Sure. I think that wasn't good. You know, plastic surgeons never did that. Uh, plastic surgeons never engaged in price wars with each other. Yeah. And, and right through recessions, 2008, they kept, kept their prices and uh, it held them in good stead. They... They fared much better than we did, but saying, come to my place, you know, a starting price, $700, and uh, th there were a lot of seminars at night with free pina coladas, and there was some marketing stuff that was, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, maybe not the best decision there. <laughs> but uh, But I think the price wars are pretty much over. Everybody has stabilized and most people are sort of within uh, the same range so thank god that's in the past but i i hope we all learned a lesson from that um i i really think the number one reason that lasik isn't performed on every 22 year old who has finished school is the the negative media uh every few years there's some big story and, yeah, and, and, and it goes, you know, worldwide. Yeah, it's like, it seems like you're, like you're right. Every couple of years, there's some big story about like the newswoman, the newscaster woman who was depressed and kills herself. And, and I never saw the, under, the relationship between why would the Lisa cause her to kill herself? Or, I, but you're right. Every, so, even recently, I think there was a, someone sent me some New York Times article recently, or Washington Post article very recently about the same kind of negative press about it. For a procedure that is, like you said, out of any elective surgery head to toe, the highest success rate. You know what's interesting? Um, 
the boomers that had it done, even though they accessed the technology when it was very early in the game, right sure. after FDA approval, and where the trackers weren't as good as they are now, nothing was as good as it was now. Those people were happy, and their kids, yeah. their kids want LASIK. Yeah. Mom and dad had LASIK, you know? Right. Uh, uh, do you find that? Do you yeah. find that in your I mean, yeah. I did the math. 22% of my cataract surgery patients have had prior LASIK or PRK. 22%. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's a huge segment of my population, sure, that had 20-some years ago, even 25, 28 years ago, had early, early days of LASIK. And you, there were, you, they, it was amazing for 20 years until they got cataracts. Yeah. And, you know, you have to really get them to think. A lot of them have forgotten. They have forgotten that yeah. they had laser vision correction. And with time, it gets harder and harder to see that flap. A 28-year-old flap is really hard to see. Uh, thank God most of those cases can be picked up with uh, topography. Yeah, you for see sure. That you, there's the big blue spot. Oh, were you nearsighted <laughs> before your LASIK? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, they all would forget, especially like if they had PRK, you see no evidence of it. No evidence. But you say, wait a minute, you're actually like this 26 and your, your care is 38. Wait a minute. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Kind of, kind of makes you think a second. You know, we also have a society where we are so dependent on our phones, iPads, devices. I see small babies in strollers playing on iPads. Yes. And I think we're going to go the way of like Singapore and Hong Kong where you see like 80% of young people being myopic. So there's going to be yeah. a greater and greater need for having yeah. vision correction. They, they predict uh, a tsunami of myopia yeah, because of this. Uh, kids don't go outside and play. They don't look off in the distance. Uh, they're looking within 18 to 22 inches of their face. Yeah. Yeah, for like six, seven, eight, ten hours a day. Huge yeah. numbers. And now even for the young kids, schoolwork is all computer, laptop-based, iPad-based, etc. So it's, it's, it's crazy that we're not more accepting of a procedure. Like I think LASIK, now, LASIK and PRK combined is still less than a million a year. Yeah, I know. While, 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 while in the U.S. we do 4 million cataracts a year. I know. Yeah. The, um, the, well, with cataracts, though, uh, you know, when you finally lose your driver's license, I mean, there, <laughs> you know, uh, <clears throat> if you choose not to have LASIK, you will not lose your driver's license. Cataracts, right. are, cataracts are a full stop, you know, uh, that right. forces right. people. And, yeah. and even if, if they choose to have... No femto, no premium IOL. You know, it is covered by insurance. So, yeah, I, I guess that's an that's an issue for it too, certainly. But you know, if you look at it from another perspective, I and mean, you wear glasses or contacts for ten years, that's already more than the cost of doing the laser vision correction. Actually, Herb Kaufman, once again, uh, about ten years into the popularity of laser vision correction, you know, maybe in the mid to late 90s, he wrote this fantastic editorial for the AJO where he said, the risk of contacts goes up every year. As you get sure. older, your eyes get drier, drier. you develop yeah. exposure keratitis, nocturnal agathomas. All these bad things start to happen to your eyes that increase the risk of contacts. Whereas mm. laser vision correction, one and done, that's it. No increased risk. It was it, it was much better written than that, and it had references, <laughs> but but it was a fantastic editorial that got a lot of attention. Yeah, it's remarkable. So, what are the steps then to increase adoption of laser vision correction among the general population, at least here in the U.S.? Honestly, uh, I think getting um, spokespeople uh, to get somebody who's admired by the various generations. You know, the boomers are too old for LASIK now. True. Uh, but to get people who are widely admired. Now, companies are a little afraid of that because the minute you pick a great spokesperson, they go off and do something terrible. They commit, <laughs> they commit a felony, you know. Or something <laughs> but to, I yeah. Think, I think it would be pretty safe, you know, picking certain individuals who have a track record of being good people. It's very powerful. As a matter of fact, um, at the ASCRS meeting, 
I noticed that uh, one of the Jonas Brothers is was in ads all over the place. Oh yeah, for, for the ICL. The, for the Evo ICL, yeah. Yeah. That's very powerful. That one of the Jonas Brothers, you know. Uh, I think we should do something like that. I really do with multiple spokespeople. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. In my own practice, a lot of times patients will say, oh, I, I know you did this celebrity, this Oscar winner surgery you did. And I was like, but that person, she doesn't know anything about ophthalmology. I did surgery on 70 fellow, I did cataract surgery for 70 fellow ophthalmologists. They know. That should mean far more. But no, the general population is more impressed with that woman who won the Oscar. Yeah. Tells you. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I really think we're missing a chance here. If the various societies chipped in with some of the big industry players, we could we could hire some great people. Yeah, it actually reminds me of this story. I don't remember all the details. It was a little before my time. But how when the FDA went to approve IOLs, they had a, an actor who played a doctor on TV yes. explaining it to them that he had the procedure done. Yes, they had Robert Young who played... Marcus Welby. Marcus Welby, MD. MD. <laughs> and uh, that was a long time ago. But you know, um, he had a huge impact. Yeah. The, the, like, at the time, he was the number one male TV star. And the senators just sat in awe, and he had a profound... Uh, he had no idea what he was talking about. You know, he was um, given a script... Sure. By, written by real doctors, but um, he, he was profoundly moving... Very influential, and uh, you know, it it it, uh, it changed the way IOLs were treated by by industry and by um, Congress. Yeah, so maybe you got. I actually like your your insight there. Maybe we should we need to find a kind of a, a spokesperson who will help kind of get it more in the mainstream. Uh, more it's... than one. More than one. Yeah. I think it takes several. Yeah. And you know, so many of the stars have already had LASIK. Yeah. Just to get just to get somebody who's happy and pay them to be a sp- spokesperson. That would be very powerful. Where do you think we're going with keratorefractive surgery versus lenticular surgery? So obviously in the last, let's say, 10, 15 years, re- refractive cataract surgery has really come onto the scene. 20 years ago, it was almost unknown. But now it's far, far more common. Where do you think... Kind of, we draw the line because now we have a spectrum of refractive possibilities. When you're very young, we can do either corneal refractive surgery, PRK, LASIK, smile now even. We can do a phagic IOL, like we talked about the, the Evo Vision ICL. We can then move along as when presbyopia hits, then we've got more options, and then obviously when it's time for lens replacement. Where do you think that's going to shift? I think they will all coexist. Um, I, I really think, <clears throat> you know, there are. Um, some people who will, due to their lifestyle, their hobbies, whatever, be more appropriate for one procedure than the other. But I don't think the ICL is going to, I know it's marching down into lower and lower myopia. It's not going to wipe out laser vision correction. Not at all. It'll all coexist. Um, I don't think there are too many people who would recommend uh, the ICL for a minus 150. Sure. You know, I mean... They, they will always, always coexist. Um, you know, just like uh, now, there isn't one IOL. There isn't one right. makeup machine. There, I mean, you know. So get more, more tools in the toolbox. You can treat basically a wider spectrum of people exactly and kind of ta- right. tailor the treatment to the patient. Exactly right. What's that uh, old expression to the man who is only... A hammer, everything looks like a nail. <laughs> yes. yes. Right. You know, you, you have to have a lot of toys, a lot of toys, and pick the one that's most appropriate for each patient. Yeah, so I, I'm obviously crazy about ophthalmology, cataract, refractive surgery. So I always think that, gosh, we can move towards, yes, corneal refractive surgery when you're like early 20s. That'll tie you over to your like 50-ish. When you're 50-ish, you get an... You get IOL replacement surgery, refractive lens exchange, with hopefully at that time a truly accommodating IOL. And then as, that, as you shift in refractive error 10, 20, 30 years down the road, you can use that new you know, refractive index shaping of the IOLs and keep adjusting the, 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 the focusing of the eye. And you can have a lifetime of incredible vision. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Yeah, 100%. 
So it's just um, like, yeah, I think it's just, it'll be, I'm, I'm so excited for that. Yeah. I think the people who are young now in their teens and early 20s will have so many wonderful things. They will never have to wear their glasses. <laughs> never. Really, they'll, uh, they'll have a brilliant future. Right. Hey, another analogy, another certain game, which I thought was very interesting, says, he says, if you could only walk with crutches, wouldn't it be amazing if you do a procedure that you never need crutches again? And he says, what if the crutches were your glasses? You just never need them again. You don't need to put these plastic things on your face. And I was like, wow, just to think of it that way makes you wonder, like, yeah, why isn't this more common? Yeah. So speaking of, our, of younger people, we have a lot of young ophthalmos who just love, love, love this podcast. And you've had an incredible career. I mean, truly a pioneering career. You've mentored so many young people. What do you think are the important things now for a younger person to face or kind of focus on in that career path? You did something very smart, which is very focused on you want to be the, 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 you know, at the cornea and refractive surgery of the cornea. So you have, you also, you're very modest. You didn't mention a lot of things. Like you were the first person also to do care, conductive keratoplasty. You're involved in this. You had, you had a lot of firsts, not just the couple we mentioned. But I think one of the neat things is everything you do is just about that one really ultra-specialized part of ophthalmology. Well, you, you've already pointed out pretty much what I think uh, a young person should do. Find something, you know, narrow your focus to something where you can excel. Mm -hmm. uh, find a mentor to help you. It really helps if you've done a fellowship. Stay in contact with your fellowship director, who, who you're with your mentor. A lot of people will finish a fellowship and then just disappear and never call back, hey, Dr. Smith, remember me? I graduated a year and a half ago. <clears throat> Do you have any projects I can help with? Do you, can I be a co-investigator on your next project? Stay in contact with that mentor and ask for yeah. career advice, uh, advice along the way. But you have to really love the project that you've got because when you drag yourself home at the end of a long day and you're exhausted and tired and all you really want to do is get a glass of wine, put your feet up and watch mm -hmm. TV, you know, to spend a few extra hours doing your research, analyzing data, etc., you have to love that project. Yeah. And have a very understanding spouse. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably the, the more important part of the equation there, for sure. But you know, there's another thing. There are very few clinician scientists. One of them, uh, I'm proud to say, is an ex-fellow of mine, Dr. Steve Wilson. He's at Cleveland Clinic. He spends half the week doing LASIK. He spends the other half of the week doing molecular biology research. Wow. In the lab, in the lab with PhDs and postdocs. And, and he's got his life carved out. Now, how many people can do that? When you finish school... Usually you have, uh, when you finish your training, usually you have six figures of debt. Right. You have a spouse who would like to get out of the studio apartment that you've been in for years. <laughs> yeah. And you might have a baby and one on the way. And are you going to take half the week to, to think great thoughts? Yeah, no. it becomes tough. You're going to start knocking out cases and making big bucks so that you can improve, your, you know, start saving for your kid's college. So... You know, when I did all the, the eczema research, I spent an enormous amount of time doing it. But I was lucky. My dad was an orthopedic surgeon. I finished with no debt. I wasn't married. I had one mouth to feed, this one right here. <laughs> and um, the fact that I didn't make a whole lot of money for years. Didn't matter. Didn't matter. I loved yeah. what I was doing, and I could afford to do it. So... <clears throat> I, there are other one or two other clinician scientists. You know, I brag about Steve Wilson all the time. He's he lets me do it. There are one or two others I don't want to mention by name, but they have extraordinary circumstances. <clears throat> no debt, uh, a spouse that makes a ton of money. Um, you know, it takes it takes a lot yeah. to allow an MD to go off and do really basic research. You know, seminal research. And um, I just hope more and more docs are able to do it. <clears throat> but even if they can't do it, to do clinical research moves the ball forward tremendously. For sure. To investigate which procedure, which drug is better. I mean, this, this you know, changes the way we practice medicine every day. 
There are a lot now in the last, let's say, 20 years of MD, PhD ophthalmologists. A lot more than in the past. Part of it is US, the U.S. started that MSTP, the Medical Scientist Training Program. So if you do an MD, PhD, all the seven or eight years of MD plus PhD combined, it's all free. So a lot of people certainly want to do that. It's very competitive. But you're right. Sometimes, though, the life gets in the way. They do this MD-PhD training, and I'd say m- more than half of the MD-PhDs who trained, did residency with us at UCLA, do zero with their PhD. They just go into practice and just get to work, and they're doing a ton of surgery. And, again, they just got to focus on life. Yeah. So it's tough. Yeah, it is very, very tough. Uh, you know, maybe we can think of a way around that in the future. But, um, but you know, they're... There are some wonderful, wonderful examples. And, uh, you know, one way to fight that is to increase the amount of money that people get on their NIH grant. If you're an MD now, sure, and you say you want to spend 50% of your time doing research on your NIH grant, they allow you to ask for a salary, but it's pitiful. It's pitiful. Oh. So. If the amount of money you could put on your NIH grant made up for all the surgeries you could have done, all the sure. office visits, then that would be a very reasonable thing, and a whole lot of people would do it. Yeah, you'd encourage more research. A whole lot of people but, would do it. But if you set it up to, to be a financial hit, only people in extreme, extraordinary circumstances are probably are, are going to yes. be able to capitalize on that. Exactly right, yeah. I also loved your advice about find something you love to do. When people find out, like for Cataract Coach, today is video number 1,850. So I've done it every day for 1,850 days, never missing a day. And they're like, either you're crazy or you really love cataract surgery. And I'm like, uh, probably a little bit of both. But Uday, do you know I've never met a cataract surgeon who doesn't use Cataract Coach? Oh, you're too, you're too sweet. No, no, no. Uh, no. That... Everybody, I use it. When I, when I want to try something I've not done before, that's where I go. I use it all the time. <clears throat> and it doesn't matter what stage you are in your career. There are so many great videos voiced over by brilliant surgeons, mostly you, but lots of great surgeons from around yeah. the world. You can find anything on there. And you, you have uh, all these years to scrub with residents and, and just handle the disasters with them in a cool, calm right. way. Uh, you know, that's why, that's why everybody admires you. That's why you got voted to the very top, because you deserve to be there. <laughs> oh, you're too sweet. Yeah, you know, I really enjoyed the teaching of the residents. Did it, I did it for 22 years. I actually retired last year at age 52. I retired from teaching the residents. Yeah, <clears throat> it was just time to change gears, pass the baton to someone else who's a little bit younger and has, uh, you know, I, I, I attended 10,000 resident cases which is a pretty good number. And, and, and you know, gosh, I don't, countless anterior vitrectomy. So no matter what happened in the case, I know how to rescue it. <laughs> you know, uh, when I was at LSU, the cornea fellows would show up on the first day. And some of them had been in the military doing cataract surgery for 10 years. So they're sitting there with gray hair and they're doing a cornea fellowship. Others were right out of residencies. Some of the residencies did not allow them to do much surgery. Some were naturally gifted, some were not. Mm-hmm. And I said, I don't care how old or young you are. I don't care where you trained. I don't care how many cases you've done. Six months from now, all your cases will look exactly the same. It's <laughs> great. No one, I love it. No one will know who's who, who did what. You will all be equally excellent six months from now. I will see to it. And they all were. They all were. Oh, I love that. Some people had to work a little harder to get there, but they all were the same in six months. Oh, that's amazing. That's it's hard. That's much harder to do in today's academic environment. But but I I I love the 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 determination there. Yeah, it is harder. Uh, Hats off to everybody who teaches, whether it's by video or in person. Hats off to the teachers. Yeah, you know the videos. That's how I actually I learn more than I contribute by making those videos. In fact, when I, years ago, when I wanted to learn DMEC, my residents, I was, the, I was the county hospital, the, my UCLA residents, and they wanted to do DMEC, and I hadn't done it before. So I watched a ton of videos. I reached out to a couple of amazing surgeons. One was uh, Veldman at University of Chicago, young guy who's a gifted surgeon. Another one was, was Martin Dierersamer from Austria. 
and I asked them for their videos. Can I host them on Cataract Coach, compile them all together? Because they make it look so easy. You put the graph in there, you tap the corner a couple times, it's done. You get... It's so much harder than that. Yes. But by, by, <laughs> by, by, by making videos of them and their secrets and their procedures, I kind of memorized everything. And then about 10 DMEC cases later, I was feeling great and I was able to teach the residents how to do it. But I guess I actually learned by video. No one taught yeah. me hands on. Yeah. Yeah. And it's good when they don't edit out the tough parts. Right. You know, uh, when they make it look really slick, uh, that doesn't really help people as much as, oops, <laughs> you know. <laughs> right. Yeah, on cataract coach, my most, some of my most popular videos are complete cataract cases where I show me operating a complete case start to finish. No edits, nothing. And you see everything as it comes, and sometimes it's me trying to three times get inside the paracentesis, something so basic that it just, but still. And other ones that are very com- popular are the complications. And so those are obviously, those are two big categories that people loved and they probably learned the most from. Yeah, yeah. And um, there used to be, they don't do it anymore, thank God, but there used to be a live cataract surgery during AAO sponsored by one of the big companies. I used to be, the, I used to be a surgeon for it. I've done tw- uh, sur- live surgery at 20 meetings. Well... My hat's off to you. Um, we used to do it at LSU. We stopped because cameramen come in who don't know anything about sterile technique. Yeah. They get up in your face with bright lights. They touch the trays. Oh, no, they, we didn't do that. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, terrible things happen. Yeah. Uh, there's extra stress on the surgeon. There's extra oh, stress sure. on the patient who can hear all this noise and all this yeah. craziness. And uh, there are lots of extra people in the room. So... Uh, I doff my chapeau to you that you were able to do that, but uh, we we just mostly it was the cameraman uh, contaminating everything that made us stop. Yeah, so the ones that I they always had really professional cameramen, but you're right, some things are different in that you couldn't hold your instruments normally. You'd have to like like I'd have to put my chopper hand in, in a in a kind of supinated position so that they could get a camera angle over my hand so I didn't block the angles. Yeah, yeah. It, and to add more stress, you had two earpieces. You had in one ear the director telling you to stand up the camera, focus up, focus down, zoom out. And the other ear, you had the moderator in the audience who was asking you questions. And hopefully the moderator was asking you about the step you were doing. As opposed to like you're doing the Rex and then the person's asking you about the, the IOL. Yeah. Which, oh, yeah. Which, which my brain can't handle. I can't yeah. chew gum and walk at the same time sometimes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'll think it simple. But you're right, yeah, that's not so popular anymore. Obviously, those have kind of tapered down. There are other countries where it's still done. I just was in Brazil last week for the Brazilian Cataract Refractive Meeting, and they had a big live study session, which I was able to be up one of the moderators of. What an amazing time. But there's a lot to learn there, and there were complications. There was an Argentinian flag sign. There was this, and so. But you're right, it is added stress for the surgeon, the patient, et cetera. But, uh, but obviously, lots to, lots, to, lots and lots to learn. Yes, indeed. Indeed. But I think that's the way we're going to now. It's like even another set of popular videos for me is people ask me, can you show LASIK videos? So I've got a handful of LASIK videos on, on, online. Oh, I've, I've probably... seen them. Oh, yeah. I've seen them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I should probably put up more of those, but I guess they're not. LASIK is such a safe procedure. I don't yeah, but... have any complication videos from LASIK. But people have to learn how to do it. No, no, but I don't have any of the complications. So I, I, I can't even think of the last time I had a complication oh. from a Lisa case. Oh, there used to be horrific complications before the femto. Oh, before with the micro, steel with the microkeratome? Micro- oh, oh. People are forgetting to put in the, the foot plate, and all of a sudden the cut goes into the anterior chamber and opens <gasps> the capsule. What? Oh, yeah. oh, 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 yeah. Oh, my God, I've never seen that. Mm, mm. So the keratone blade ends up entering like the limbus... Hitting, entering the AC, hitting the, the lens capsule. And the eye, and tearing up the iris usually, too. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah. See, things like that can't happen anymore with the femto. Uh, the worst thing that ever happened in my professional career, do I have the time to tell you? Yeah, we have as much time as you want. So, the worst thing, knock on wood, knock on wood, so far, the worst thing that's ever happened to me was before the femto, I was doing LASIK with a brand new microkeratome that I bought at the Academy, and I liked it because it was called the Innovatome. It had these huge 
brass walls that kept out eyelashes. Mm. So the kiss of death back then was that an eyelash would flip into your track and ruin the flap. So I was using it and I used it all day and everything was going great. It had a design flaw though that I didn't know about and it was removed from the market uh, a week or two later because disasters were happening all over the country. And the problem was the foot plate, which always went in on these microkeratomes, you heard a click. Mm -hmm. It clicked in upside down or right side up. Oh. So all the microkeratomes were designed so that you could only click it in one way. Sure. So on the last case of the day, my very tired, Technician clicks it in upside down. I make the pass. I look down. There's aqueous coming out of uh, the center <gasps> of the cornea. Oh my goodness! So she was minus eight. Uh, so actually, let me go back. I make the pass and I start the ablation and I see aqueous. I actually got through, it's been a while since I talked about this case, I got through 94% of her ablation before I saw aqueous. I did not realize the flap was too thick. It flipped mm-hmm. back, it reflected. So I close it and I talk to her and her husband and I said, I'm not sure why this happened, but the flap is too thick. And some fluid came out of the eye and we're gonna see her tomorrow. I pressure patched it the next day. It was a mess, I had to suture it. I should have sutured it then, but I didn't have any sutures. I didn't have a suture tray with me in the laser center. The next day I was prepared, I sutured it, and I'll make a long story short. I said, hang in there, topography guided ablations are coming. I took out the sutures. She ended up minus 14 plus eight at 75, best corrected 2060. This is scarred into my brain. I remember those numbers. Yeah. So we're waiting and waiting. And she said, Dr. McDonald, I'm sick of waiting. I'm sick of waiting. So I call Julian Stevens in London. And I said, Julian, we finished the clinical trial here for uh, wavefront guided ablations. You've got one though at Moorfields. Can I fly my patient over there? Can you do a wavefront guided ablation on this poor lady? I paid for her and her sister out of my own pocket to fly to London. I put them in a very fine hotel, the Marriott Courtyard, (laughs) right near Moorfields. I said, I'll pay for everything, Julian, fix her. So he called me and he said, Marguerite, uh, we can't handle that. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do uh, basically clear lens uh, extraction and I'm going to make her hyperopic. I have an IOL that will correct almost all 14 diopters of astigmatism. And uh, we'll make her hyperopic so that when we come back and do wavefront treatments, all the shots will be in the periphery and far away from the perf. Sure. So he did a brilliant job. She comes back to me. We wait three months. She, it was amazing. I mean, they have IOLs, IOLs outside, outside the United States that we just don't have. Yeah. So she flies back. And at this point, she was like plus two, minus one at 80 degrees and she was about 20, 40, best corrected. He does a wavefront based ablation. She ends up 20, 25 plus two without correction. Wow. And she, I sent her and her sister twice. Julian, Julian was very gracious. He said, I'm not gonna give you a bill for more fields. You've, you've already paid countless thousands. She's 2025 plus two without correction after two trips to England. And she looks at me and says, Dr. McDonald, when are you going to do my other eye? Wow, I love it. Because she knows how much you care. You care so deeply about her. So this is a long time ago. I used up all my Marriott miles. I used up all my Amex miles and another <laughs> $25,000. This was a long time ago. Yeah. That, was, that would be like oh, about 100K here. But... She knew I would take a bullet for her. She knew I would do anything for her. And uh, when she, I, I got tears in my eyes when she asked me, when are we going to do my second eye? <laughs> That's amazing. 
Uh, it's such an amazing and, story. By, by the way, her second eye I did as a PRK. <laughs> yeah, no flap needed. Well, that, that begs the question. In today, where, where we are today with technology, how do you decide PRK, LASIK? What's your preference? Well, you're going to think I changed because of her. I did not. But I, I have become, I've gone back after years and years and years of doing mostly LASIK, I've gone back to doing 100% PRK. I have a perioperative regimen. They don't have any pain. They walk in the next day uh, with white eyes, and they're usually at least 20, 25 the next day, even though they still have a defect, an epithelial defect that's closing. But my perioperative regimen, I've taken years to perfect it. It's just wonderful. They don't- can, you give it, can you give us some insight? I want a copy. I will be glad to send it to you. I'll be glad to send it to anybody. Uh, the, the heart of it, well, first I use the EpiClear device to remove okay. the epithelium, which is designed uh, in Israel. It's this fantastic disposable item, uh, no moving parts, uh, single use, but it scoops up the epithelium and it leaves basement membrane. You think, why is that important? You're going to shoot it off anyway. Well, in the periphery, it leaves basement membrane, so the epithelium rushes in much faster. Mm. So I use the EpiClear, but probably the key to success is to give them a neurosurgical dose of oral steroids 20 minutes before the case. So if they're otherwise healthy, they're not diabetic, they get 80 milligrams of prednisone exactly 20 minutes before the laser fires, not 30, not 40. I've studied the timing. And um, then the next day, they get 80. So it's 80, 80, 40, 20, 10, 5, and then they're off. And I give them uh, the equivalent of Zantac, uh, you know, something to protect their stomach, sure. BID for that whole time. A huge slug. By the way, I give everybody, except for brittle diabetics, everybody gets IV steroids after cataract surgery, after everything. Steroids are the key to no pain and for dead quiet eyes the next well, day. So even, even eye well surgery, given IV steroids, like what dose? What are we given? So I usually give 100 of uh, IV uh, Sayu Cortef. Okay. Uh, so they get IV push, and I'm studying right now whether it should be at the very beginning of the case, the middle, the end. It, it mm. doesn't seem to matter. But they come in the next day, and their eyes are dead mm. quiet. And, you know, there was a study done by the uh, Amidrios people. Uh, it's not well known, but 35% of cataract patients complain bitterly of pain within the first 48 hours. And we don't, we don't seem to recognize that. Hmm. I guess a lot of us have our patients seen by optometrists or cornea fellows or whatever. But, um, man, they have no pain. And, you know... If you do a pterygium, usually they're in agony. Sure. They're in agony. Mm -mm. Not if you give them uh, a massive uh, IV dose of Cyacortef while they're on the wow. table. They come in the next day smiling. Did you take any Vicodin? No. I mean, it's just a game changer for uh, ocular pain. Now, obviously, you know, if you have a well-controlled type 2 diabetic, you can give them... Uh, I, I usually uh, consult with the anesthesiologist exactly what the dose would be, and sometimes I have to skip it. You have somebody, sure. a labile diabetic, type 2 or type 1, skip it. But whenever I can, I do it, and it's magical oral steroids, high dose, magical for uh, surface PRK. ablation. So then, then what are you doing in your post-op regimen? Are you, are you using mitomycin intraop? No, only if the ablation is uh, greater than 75 microns. Hmm. And I, then if I do use it, it's only for 15 seconds because longer than that, you have to come up with a whole new uh, algorithm. Sure. But um, so other things I do, of course, I, antibiotics, etc. I do give them Acuvale. I allow them to use Acuvale. Uh, so that's, that's Ketorolac, preservative-free. Preservative-free, right. But the other key to success, and this is from David Gartry uh, of... Uh, St. Thomas in London. He published a paper about 25 years ago showing that one tenth of 1% tetracaine, preservative free, if you give it to a surface ablation patient and you let them take it up to every hour while awake for the first three days, it doesn't slow re epithelialization at all and it helps. 
So one tenth a normal dose, then basically. One tenth, one so, percent. No, they gotcha. get to take it home. So I order that. Now I have to say I might back off on that because the oral steroids. Just so Gartry good. Didn't didn't Gartry didn't use the massive yeah. dose of oral steroids with the rapid taper, but um, yeah, my patients are comfortable, and they tell their friends they're comfortable, and wow. uh, you know. And then bandage contact lens for a couple of days. Yeah, and, and yes, they definitely get a bandage contact lens. What I will do, and, and of course, if they're tiny, if they're 116 pounds or less, I start with 60, 60, 60, 30, 15, 10, 5 off. But um, I'd be glad to send you my regimen, and you can stick it on Cataract Coach. No, hey, there's a lot to learn there. Honestly, I'd be happy to feature that for sure. My pleasure. Wow, that's neat stuff. So, so you switched completely away. So no more, no femto LASIK for you at all. No smile, just basically service ablation. Right, right. And yeah. you know what? Yeah, it's a wonderful life. You can't have a flap complication if you don't have a flap. Now, you can have a, you can make a gorgeous flap, and then the patient rubs their eyes and they come <laughs> the next day, and the flap is hanging. You know, yeah. I mean, you can be the best surgeon in the world and still have a significant flap complication, even in 2023. But yeah. if you don't have a flap. Yeah, it's a good point, it's a good point. And, and not much issue with haze then. So you said as long as the ablation is 75 microns or less, you don't end up seeing stromal haze? No, but I will say, there's some regional differences, like the surgeons in Saudi Arabia or the surgeons in Mexico. The closer you are to the equator, the more aggressive you have to be about mitomycin. Sure. Uh, the more ultraviolet light they get. Yeah. So, you know, if I worked in it, but this works in uh, New York. It works in New York. Are you doing anything else like uh, vitamin C afterwards, things of this nature, or not oh, really? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. They take, they take big doses of vitamin C. I, I'm going to send it to you. So be, we'll, we'll make a video out of it. The patient is very busy. They're doing lots of stuff, <laughs> but the doctor isn't busy. <laughs> the doctor just gives them the sheet and tells them what to do. Um, it, it costs me about $60 a bottle to make the little uh, vial of... Te well, it's they can't overdose on it. There's not enough. Sure. Um, I think it's just three cc's, but uh, most of them throw it away. They don't use much, but it's nice for them to have it as an escape, just in case. As a, as a rescue med, let's say. Right. Yeah, rescue med. Yeah. And what's the most you'll do on an ablation? What's your high end? Ooh. Or... Does it depend on the patient, the anatomy, the I read, pupil it size? It depends on a lot of things, but I'm really, I would, uh, I wouldn't go over minus eight. I wouldn't. Got it. Um, bad things start to happen. Then you do start to get haze, um, and even though the ablation profiles are great now, um, you start to get some optical aberrations. Image quality uh, issues, sure. Terrible. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't go above minus eight. Then it's time to go do the, the Evo, you know? I mean... Yeah, right. That's what you said. Have a yeah. spectrum of yeah. surgical options so you can offer kind of everything to your, your patient population. Yeah. Well, that's a, such great pearls here. Well, we definitely have to do the cataract coach video for, for PRK or service ablation and, and your regimen because I think there's a lot to learn there. And I think it's an easy way for a lot of surgeons who don't, you know, currently do keratorefractive surgery. It's an easy way to get into it. And I will tell you, if you do one LASIK a year, it's dangerous. If you do one PRK a year, you will do a great job. Uh, it's, you, it's great for somebody who's starting. It's great for a lower volume refractive sure. surgeon. You really, you know, with the trackers, with everything today, you just can't really get in trouble. You really can't. Right. Uh, and I often, I have often told the big companies, why don't you have weekend PRK courses? You know, yeah. a lot of the premium channel IOL patients are unhappy because the surgeon missed planum. Right, there's a residual refractive error. You know. Clean it teach, up. Teach doctors how to do it. It's a weekend course how to do PRK. Nobody wants to do that. I think that's an opportunity there that has been missed. Well, then you know what? We have to do a cataract coach PRK series then. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll teach you with videos anyway. Okay. Well, You're thank on. you, Marguerite. I want to say thanks. You What an incredible podcast. I really enjoyed talking to you. The history of how the eczema laser was basically developed still blows my mind of how many kind of serendipitous things had to happen just for this to go through. 
And I really want to commend you on what you've done in this field. It's so amazing. And if you don't know, if you ever see Margarita at a meeting, you can absolutely go up to her and ask for advice. You are the kindest person I know in this field. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So. That, that touches me. Thank you, Uding. All and, right, guys. Uh, uh, have a wonderful evening. And thank you. And then, and the next podcast is coming up. As you know, now we're doing Cataract Coach Podcast every single week. And you know I'm not going to miss a week. So check it out <laughs> next time. Thanks, Uday. Bye-bye. Okay. Wow, that was great. Thank you, Dr. McDonald. I learned so much from this podcast. And I want to thank you guys for listening to it. I trust that you enjoyed it and also learned quite a lot. We're going to have the full recipe of her cocktail for the PRK patients, even the cataract patients, on our cataractcoach.com website. I want to encourage you to also download our podcast, Apple, Amazon, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts from. Subscribe, search for Cataract Coach, search for my name. It'll all come up. That way you can enjoy it while you're exercising or driving to work. And we'll see you next week for yet another episode. Remember, we're doing these every single week. See you soon.